Hello? Okay. Very good. So, um, welcome all to this panel discussion. Um, it's actually an honor for me to be up here with this uh, panel, uh, a really fantastic panel. We have three successive secretaries of uh, the Department of Biotechnology. We have uh, the present director of the Wellcome Trust. Uh, we have the first, the founding CEO of the, uh, of the India Alliance. And what I'm hoping to do is to give you two vignettes. So one is sort of the inside story, the past, present, and future, as this panel has been uh, set up uh, to do. And the other is to explore in sort of more open discussion, two themes. Um, the themes are scale and balance, and we've heard a lot about that already. Uh, on the question of scale, how does a targeted uh, initiative like this actually make an impact in a country as large, diverse, with the kinds of needs that India has um, within a reasonable amount of time? And the second of balance, how do you balance uh, basic, applied, clinical, translational, we've heard a lot of different words, the competing requirements of these different kinds of science. So to an individual researcher, science is an adventure, um, but to society and th to the government, science is an investment. Um, science is unpredictable, it takes time. On the other hand, science can save lives, and the lives are, the, the needs are immediate. Um, so the question of balancing these competing requirements and contradictions is what makes the administration of science funding so interesting, so much of a challenge, um, and what I'd like to do then is explore how much of an impact this particular program has had in meeting these challenges of scale and balance. So what I'll do to start with is I'm going to ask uh, the panelists one by one to tell us, as it were, the inside story, um, after which I will lead on with, uh, with further questions. Um, so to begin, I'm going to turn to um, Jeremy Farrar. Um, so what is the Wellcome Trust's goal in funding science internationally, and where does India uh, where, do, where is India placed in the scheme of your previous and your future uh, targeting? Uh, those are big questions. Um, firstly, I, I don't think there is any science which is not international. Um, uh, it doesn't really matter which of those big challenges I talked about, or indeed the Honourable President talked about, climate change, drug resistance, uh, non-communicable diseases, wh whatever you believe to be the great challenges of our time, uh, there is no solution to any of them that will come from a single country. Uh, so I, don't, I believe science is inherently international um, and it has to be addressed in an international way. And secondly, um, by sheer dint of numbers, there is no global health without health in India. Um, and indeed, there is no science, global science, without science in India. Um, with the population you have, with the investments you've already made, with the scientific uh, excellence that does exist here, uh, there is going to be no progress at a global scale bringing science to bear on people's lives without that having a center of gravity here in India. So um, I don't know how much more important than that it could be. Okay, thank you. So when the alliance was first set up, of course, it made a huge difference to fellows like myself. Our science was supported. We could do things we could not have otherwise done. But the other thing the Alliance did was it changed the landscape of science funding and administration uh, in the country. It presented a new way of, of doing things. And uh, on, on that point, I'd like uh, Dr. Bhan first and then Dr. Vijay Raghavan to both comment. Uh, Dr. Bhan first. Um, when the idea for such an alliance came together, uh, when Mark Wolpert was the director of the Wellcome Trust, and you were the secretary of the Department of Biotechnology. Could you tell us what the genesis of this idea was? Did it happen over coffee? Did, were you, was this idea in the pipeline for many years? Uh, how did it actually get started? Over a glass of wine, not coffee. <laughs> okay. Actually, uh, opportunities in life arise in strange, unpredictable ways. And our only duty in life and responsibility is what do we do with those opportunities. But when I think back, uh, most things that I did in my life happened like this. Uh, but I think there is an underlying awareness, preparation in your mind that makes you twist a conversation which is casual into something which is productive. Uh, what were those concerns? 
I was uh, an individual researcher, a doctor, trying to make my life as useful to children as possible. And I certainly got into a public role in DVT, and I realized that I don't know enough about uh, the way things happen in India. I probably knew more about how the world runs than about how India runs. And so I decided to travel and meet people for several months. And then I told Mr. Kapil Sibyl once and I said, you know, you are the science minister. Let me take you around for a couple of weeks and show you how the world science runs. And I think it was the best decision we made. It gave us a sense of preparation about how this world runs in education and science. So there were three concerns in my mind, and then I will tell you exactly how I met Mark. One was that we don't seem to figure in the top 2% of scientific publications. Second, a comment by a colleague that I said, I went to a meeting of directors and deans. I didn't see any leaders around. When I asked them what can we do to nurture science in India, they only had complaints of the kind that my maid at home always has, you know, the kind of day-to-day -day stuff. And I was saying, what have we done to these people? I used to say this to many friends at AIMS when people who did 12 years of medicine, when they finished this senior residency and they would, on their way out, they would ask me, Sir, what do you think we should do? What should I do in life now? And I was saying, God, is this what we did to you? <laughs> that you have to come me after spending 12 years with us and you don't have a sense of your own future. <laughs> so I realized we're not good at nurturing people. But you have to go back to the history of this country. After independence, there was a huge tussle between nurturing excellence and inclusiveness in education. You should read this story of India's education by a Nobel Prize winning economist from Stanford. It is a brilliant book about the, the conflicts and choices India had to make. And the central university system was actually created because they realized that state governments will have to go for inclusiveness and get all the children in. No, stop worrying about marks, but give everyone an education. But then there was this concern how do we nurture the top 1% of India to provide the leadership for different fields in education, science, health, agriculture, in different fields? You know. So this concern was there in my mind. And the third striking thing in my mind was, we've had a great past, but we had a few centuries that were very difficult for India. We always tend to go back to that old glorious past because we don't know how to deal with these gap years of two, three hundred, four hundred, five hundred years. And I wanted India to be considered a very attractive partner. You understand the word attractive? Is great to do things with, values excellence, values relevance and social issues. Uh, beautifully governed, gently governed. And in pediatrics we say nurturing care is the word that we use for small babies. And this was in my mind that India's most brightest are not being given nurturing care by the agencies that fund science. They kind of go after you, uh, you know, and then you ask the question, I said, no, we need a different culture. So there were in this background in my mind a, a certain concerns about how India needs to change in future. And then I get a call from uh, the ICGB director and said that we are having a science meeting here. Would you come for a drink? And I went there. It was very dark in the lawns. I was actually very tired. And I was going to get a glass of wine. And with me, I saw another British-looking gentleman, and he was also pushing his hand up, and I thought, I'm being very discourteous, so I picked up a glass and gave it to him. I apologized. I said, I was thirsty, so I looked a little aggressive. <laughs> so he said, I'm Mark. So I said, I'm Dr. Barn. For some reason, he suddenly asked me, what do you think about the Welcome Trust Fellowships? 
I said, excellent without relevance. <laughs> now, you know, at that 8 o'clock in the evening when you're tired after government work, you can just about say anything to anyone. So he said, explain yourself. I said, you have five fellows in India. We have 1.3 billion people in India. So the question is about scale. So I am a person who worries about health, and scale is the only thing we discuss. So he said, what would you do? I said, I would partner with me. I am a very attractive partner. <laughs> and I would put a pound for every pound you put, and I will fund a thousand people every year. And he said, what shall I tell my board? I said, you tell them that the science in the world is run by good scientists, brilliant scientists. It doesn't matter where they come from, because we have no control over who works where in the world. But we all gain from scientific knowledge. So you use India as a laboratory, as one of the laboratories, to produce scientists, brilliant scientists for the world. They don't have to be here. And he said, that's a good argument. I forgot about this. A month later, I get a mail from him. He says, I went to the board, I narrated the conversation, and I told them that you promised two pounds for every pound. <laughs> and so I wrote back to him saying, after the third glass of wine, I consider myself totally not responsible for anything I say. I meant one pound for a pound, you heard something. But I now remember you also had three drinks, so I don't know whether you got it right. And we just talked about this. But it was very clear to me that in welcoming the generosity of Welcome Trust, whom I respect immensely, I was really trying to give a message to my own people that don't be possessive, but learn to travel with the best in the world. <coughs> By traveling with the best in the world doesn't mean you let them think for you. You think with them. And that requires the design and architecture of doing things that permits that co-traveling of equals, seeking glory. And the design of this trust is a depiction of that sense, dignity across the place, for those people who apply for fellowships, those people who judge. The whole ethos should be dignity and class. And so excellence must be a part of the way you do things if you're pursuit is excellent. Last minute, when I went to the cabinet, and they said, you want so much money? And you have no committee, no board, no trust? I said, no, two trustees. So I remember Mr. Chidambaram asked me and said, how will you avoid mayhem? So I just whispered back, I said, a committee of scoundrels is being replaced by two most trusted, beautiful trustees. Trust them and let them do things. And I think, the, as I keep saying, that design of how you serve creative people is as important. Because in that you give them a message of love and caring, that nurturing care that the brightest in the world deserve. The world without leaders is dangerous. And I think today we realize this more than ever. And to produce those leaders, you have to nurture them over time. And for that, you need the right instruments. And I think, you know, the, way, the uh, reputation that Welcome Trust, NIH, over these years, the National Science Board, and many other such agencies have for how to nurture the best in the world is something that is really admirable. So I just want to end by saying uh, luck favors the prepared mind. The preparation is your concerns. And your sense of how to create beauty, how to create excellence, how to nurture excellence. If you're clear in your mind about those things, you tend to make the right decisions. And I think other people sense it in you that you could be an attractive partner. And so what we try to nurture in DBT all the time is be attractive. Don't worry about being in control. Be attractive. So everyone comes and seeks you. Everyone wants to work with you. And so you can travel with them. So this has been a really outstanding relationship. 
and uh, I think this is the way India's future can be designed. Vijay. So, so Mukund, what was the question again? The ever humble Dr. Bhan doesn't uh, give enough credit. I, I think you can see by reading between the lines of what he said, it was far from an accidental meeting that set this up. It was a lot of thought and preparation. Uh, following up on that topic to uh, Dr. Vijay Raghavan, Dr. Bhan mentioned the idea of culture. Um, could you tell us, you know, why did it take the Welcome Trust to get this done? Uh, and was there a clash of cultures in uh, bringing this new way of working uh, into an existing ecosystem? Uh, or, or did it, uh, was there a fertile soil and it just was a natural fit and things took root very early? Well, um, I think many of these points Dr. Ban has actually um, addressed. And by the way, he's terrific. Have you ever been to Himachal and seen these trucks? I've said this before. Uh, trying to start up in the cold winter, they don't, and someone wraps a blanket around them and lights a fire on the engine, and then they get started. But once they get started, you can't stop them. So Dr. Ban is like that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so he's a diesel engine which, you know, can, can pull a lot of uh, stuff. And if your question is, how is it that the Alliance has a functional ecosystem, different from the ecosystem of science funding in the country. How did that happen? And why did it take the Welcome Trust to come in? It has two components to that. One is a component which Dr. Ban addressed about when he mentioned the central university system and the state university system. But that's a challenge in funding agencies also. Constantly balancing the need for equity versus excellence. And this is a problem which is there in the UK, in the US, and everywhere else with government funding agencies. There is a model which was addressed by Holden, not JBS Holden, his brother or cousin, which went into this issue about if you kept funding excellence, then that excellence would get, keep getting better and you wouldn't get the spread of excellence. So how do you balance your funding so that there's spread of excellence as well as, you know, you find quality. And this is a challenge which funding agencies have. And in doing that, we take people as members of our committees who represent both components, both the ecosystem and excellence. And inevitably, this spirals into a complicated, messy affair. And our structures of funding indeed need to get better. And there is, there is a fundamental uh, issue over there. But more importantly, you must keep in mind the creation of the alliance. Technically, it is an autonomous institution supported by the government of India and the Welcome Trust. There is no intrinsic reason that it should function well. The only reason why it functioned well is because the DBT and the Welcome Trust took an interest in seeing that it functions well and its first CEO put in place a culture of a certain form of uh, functioning it could very easily have gone in a completely different track if this three components, the trust, the DBT, and the first CEO did not put these things in place in the right way. And that has happened to many of our autonomous institutions. Legally and technically, there is no difference between the alliance structure and many of our autonomous institutions. And just as some of them function well and some of them don't, because of their intrinsic properties, similarly intrinsic properties are also responsible for some of the messes which we have made. So it's not just that one needs the Welcome Trust or not. There are mechanisms where things can work well, but it's, it's always a challenge to try and match that with broadening the capacity in a messy environment. And that's something we have to deal with. Thank you. So, um, in fact, it uh, is a good segue to my uh, next question, which is to uh, Dr. Anuradha Lohia, the first, the founding CEO of the Welcome Trust DBT India Alliance. Uh, Dr. Lohia, a couple of questions. The first one is uh, on Vijay's point. What were the challenges with setting up your own culture? Um, also, the decision to set up the alliance in Hyderabad uh, sort of gave you the space to do things differently. How did you approach that challenge and what were the troubles you faced in the first few years? I must thank Vijay for his very kind words. 
I think I was the first accidental CEO. I never in my life thought I would be doing anything administrative. <clears throat> and Vijay, of course, all of us here in the auditorium who have been swayed when Vijay has decided on something, realize you want to do exactly what Vijay wants you to do. So, and he has this very charming manner in which he can wipe out all issues, all doubts in a sweep of a hand. And I remember getting this very early morning phone call from Vijay from some part of the world where he was trying to convince me that I should take up this challenge. To cut a long story short, I really didn't know why I should be doing it. But yes, I agreed to Vijay. I don't know why, or I know why, because it was Vijay. And then I met Dr. Bhan and I got really scared mm -hmm. because I thought I won't be able to do it. But we sorted things out. And by the time I arrived in Delhi to meet the trustees and the director of the Welcome Trust, panic had set in again. I, I was clueless. I had never looked beyond fund management of my grants, which were really small. But that's the point. Why were my grants so small? Why was I like Dr. Bhan's maidservant who complained and complained? And that's what drove me to take up the challenge once I had been pushed into the deep end. Why Hyderabad? I knew I could not move to Delhi for personal reasons. I ideally wanted it, the office to be in Calcutta where my laboratory was. But there were other concerns that the DBT at that time had and we could not set up the office in Calcutta, although the Wellcome Trust was fine with that. But I understood the, the local sensitivity. And then we started looking for what would be the most cost-effective place to set up an international organization with government partnership. And surprises of surprises, it was Hyderabad which offered the best of all the worlds in terms of economy, in terms of talent, in terms of uh, rent, logistics, everything. Um, so I learned a lot of things and before I became a CEO who could contribute, I was a student who was learning how to rent a building, how to hire uh, people. And I am happy to see Sarita Vincent here. She was my first employee who I hired. She was my secretary, that's the first person I had. And the smart thing was to hire a local first so they can take you through. The challenges were because neither the Wellcome Trust or I knew what our costing should be. So the first thing was to learn money. Uh, so I learned. And then the next thing was to set up this culture and do everything different, at least to the point which we all wanted to change. That was the funding system. And constantly at my side was Vijay. Dr. Natesh at that time from DBT, Shelja, who has been very kind and was here, and Jimmy Whitworth, who was a trustee at that time. And the idea to have a selection committee which had 50% members who were from India and the remaining from the rest of the world. This was a challenge. We had long lists of people who we had to talk to, who we had to see if they would function in our committees. The ones we wanted didn't want to come. The ones we were not so sure of were eager to come. So to find this you know, middle ground, to pick the best things, and then that was not enough. To ensure that there was no conflict of interest when selections were made. Science is global. Everyone knew everyone. So how do we do it? And then to decide that no, who would be the first reviewer, who would be the second reviewer, these were things I set up with my team. And we had to work very hard and look at the background and make sure no one ever had any links earlier. This was really, really hard. The second thing which was very hard was to set up the online system. Wellcome Trust had a very robust system, but they also had a massive system. We couldn't just take that from the trust and bring it to the India Alliance we had to form a reduced but an effective system which was on the lines of the trust. And to do so, we thought we are in IT city, Hyderabad, we would get software companies who will set it up. Surprise, surprise. It didn't happen. We got two youngsters from Ireland 
who not only were the lowest bidders, but the most talented, who came to Hyderabad, sat with us, and got our needs, designed it, and finally my team went to London, to the Wellcome Trust, where the Wellcome Trust uh, representative, Sean Hussain, grilled them and grilled them and grilled them. And what, in the end, surprise, we developed something totally new. So the Wellcome Trust got something new from us. We got, of course, everything new. And the Irish kids learned something very different. And they understood how to work with the Indian sensitivity as well. That was the second challenge. The third challenge, and this again Vijay was instrumental in it, was to set up a financial system which would be absolutely rigorous. He said to prepare a document which could be imported into our funding agencies in India. And with the help of Jenny Kiffin in the Wellcome Trust, with the help of our finance officer, Nataraj, I'm very happy to see you today again, and Mr. Praveen Gupta, who we had a consultant from Delhi. We worked very hard, and Jenny was a very hard taskmaster. Give me a run for my money. And we also had the financial advisor from DBT, Dr. Pandya, Mr. Pandyan at that time, who was wonderfully supportive and had the right blend of diplomacy and rigor to see us through. And I still remember it took me almost three years to get to a near complete version of that financial document. And my biggest compliment came when Vijay approved of it and said, let DBT have a copy of this. So if you've been able to make three differences, one was to change the selection procedure, which was truly became global. And the scientists who came from as far as San Diego, I think Shankar I saw in the auditorium today. Hello, Shankar. And, uh, people from the UK, people from Noel, uh, George is here, and Peter Rigby, and everybody really worked very hard. We had very polite disagreements, and uh, we agreed to disagree and then agree on a consensus and a system. And Mike, as the chair of the senior committee, was absolutely wonderful in guiding us through this process. I'm very proud of the selection procedure. Some, many people who expected to get the fellowship and didn't learned much later why they didn't. And I think we helped them improve their science. They may have missed their chance at the India Alliance, but they became better scientists. We also helped people. The, the, the fourth challenge, if I may take two more minutes, was actually setting up the early career fellowship. India didn't have a, a culture of postdoctoral fellowships. Even though the DBT had set up a DBT postdoctoral fellowship, we found that in that fellowship, people who had not got a postdoc abroad and were waiting for their degrees would get it. But here we meant serious business. And our first year was very frustrating. We did not get good candidates, so we did not give the fellowships. Then I started something called, with the advice of many at the organization, <coughs> is to do personal uh, mentoring at different levels to PhD students. So we went to different institutes, we went to different universities, and we gave them a lot of mentoring as to why they could do a postdoc in India. They all wanted to stay with their supervisors, their PhD supervisors, and we said, no way. You have to go to a different Indian lab. We'll give you so much money that it is not for money that you must leave India. You must stay in India. Now, this was a challenge. I think I was very happy to hear the numbers today of the Early Career Fellowship. In my first three years, that did not happen. It was very, very hard. <coughs> it was hard also to get the senior fellowships. The intermediate was the best branch. They were the ones ready to come back, ready to shoot from the hip, get into the 1,000 jobs a year that Dr. Bahan had promised. <coughs> and we were also lucky at that time that the US economy was going down. So they were all happy to come back. There were no faculty positions. And I want to just sign off with one last comment that the Welcome Trust DBT India Alliance Fellowship uh, organization was set up at the same time as several other international collaborations, some with the US, with the government of India, which was with DST. Um, and I remember in one of my trips to NIH, some, a very senior and prominent scientist asked me, how did you make it work? We have been banging our heads, and it hasn't worked. So Vijay, I think it was our team, and the will to survive, 
And Dr. Bhan, I wish you'd had another glass of wine because you would have given us even more direction and this will to fly. And with the last glass of wine, I must tell you, I almost did not get my job because I was going to spill it on Mark Walpert. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you very much. It has been a wonderful experience. Thank you, Dr. Lahir. So in fact, uh, I didn't even know there was all these details from behind the scenes. Um, you know, the reason the internet is so robust is that the architecture they put into place right at the beginning about how packets were transferred scales up to the size of the internet today. Um, and I think the fact that this, the structures you put in place, the committees with such dedication, the same people have been coming back year after year, uh, really speaks to how much went right, right at the beginning. And all credit to you for that. Um, so, so finally, um, to Dr. Renu Swaroop. Um, so you gave us uh, during your uh, talk uh, earlier a lot of tantalizing hints about where you hoped this organization would go. So could you share with us, um, you know, maybe your biggest dreams about how you feel the alliance could contribute to goals more broadly, nationally? Um, and what are the new initiatives that are going to be put in place that enable that kind of trajectory? Thank you, Mukund. Uh, having heard Dr. Bhan giving his vision for how this whole alliance was set up and, uh, and rather bringing out the challenges, it's important to understand now that this has been created as a very robust system now. It's got a strong foundation. It started with a very large vision. Thousand was the number which Dr. Bhan said. But I think it's important for us to keep in mind two things that you mentioned as well. <clears throat> How do we have the balance and the scale? We look at a scale, it's important to look at scaling without compromising on any of the quality parameters which have been built into this very important system. The fear of scaling without keeping that in mind is you just scale for numbers and you lose the quality as it goes. So I think our first and most important challenge is how do we actually now build on this very strong foundation and see where that design needs to move to be able to build in the scalability, build in those modules as you take them forward and keep the quality there. The balance that you mentioned is also very important because we now need to balance a lot of, you know, you, you need to look at, of course, ensuring that there is a balance between the, the groups that we bring into this we, the president did speak about the gender balance, so that, of course, we are all conscious about, and I'm sure as we scale, that would be one component that we keep in mind. But it's also important for us to note that we spoke about numbers. We have 320 that we talk about. For a country as vast as India, if we have to actually build excellence, probably with these 320, we've established those centers which can then now work with others to be able to expand it across the country. So I think an expansion of, you know, geographically of our footprint to Pan-India is really what is now what we need to do as we move into the next phase. It's important for us to see that we don't have these pockets of excellence just in certain areas within the country, but we become more inclusive and we can get in other groups as well across the country. The university system is, yes, what we did speak about more and more because we do feel that as we are moving in our innovation ecosystem, it's important to connect both the ends to our translational research institutes, and that's the university at one end and the industry on the other. So I think this alliance now needs to look at how it moves to scale, connecting the university, the research, the academia, and the industry. So that entire value chain needs to be connected to see how we can then be more inclusive to take it forward. There's another important point for us to keep in mind. We have now said that as we move into the next phase, uh, I think what Dr. Bahan had said, two pounds to one pound, probably we've now agreed on that, sir, and we do have two pounds to one pound that has been committed. But I think it's because we have accepted and looked at with confidence <laughs> what we've already been able to um, create within the country. 
and we have the confidence that we would be able to take it forward. But it's also important to keep in mind that over these 10 years, the whole ecosystem within the country has also gone, it's changed a lot. While we look at a lot of national priorities, and as Jeremy said rightly, there is no national or international science left now. There is no national or international priority. These are all global challenges which we are addressing. Be it our partnership in CEPI, be it our partnership for AMR, be it our partnership for the climate change activities, be it our partnership for One Health that we take on. These are all global challenges. So the capacities that we build within this country would need to be capacities which can then be at par with international partnerships that we take on. So we also need to have the numbers to be able to meet there. So I think that, keeping that in mind, it's important for us to see that we, uh, we do have a geographic uh, and an inclusive footprint as we move on. And lastly, I think it's important that while all the challenges which have been listed out, uh, we had a whole lot of them today. Uh, we had the challenges and the priorities for the next phase. It's going to be a daunting task for the CEO to see how uh, their team actually covers all these various challenges with uh, Jeremy had listed out, our minister had listed out, uh, the Honorable President listed out a lot of challenges. But I think it's also important that while we've agreed on one component that we're moving from fellowships to also taking out now collaborative research, I think that's a change that is happening and probably that's going to bring in a lot of difference into this fellowship program or this alliance program as it moves. So I think that is going to be important. We've also said that we would look at some sort of virtual centers or networks which would be created. I think that is clearly an indication of India now saying that yes, we are ready to take on that leadership position, be it regional, be it national or global, and become part of these international uh, partnerships for not only fellowships, but for the collaborative research and taking on the virtual center. So it's important to say that when we are moving into a second phase, there has to be something new. It cannot be business as usual. And if that is really the message, which I'm sure each one of us has got as we moved on, but we hope uh, with the benchmarks which this alliance has set in these 10 years, uh, they would sort of set much, much higher benchmarks as they move into the next phase. And we all look forward to that uh, capacity that will be created. Thank you. So, thank you. so now we, we have a little bit of time. So I, I, uh, as I'd hoped, this, was, this gave you a chronological snapshot of the past, present, and, and future of the Alliance. And I want to now move to a more thematic uh, type of discussion. And uh, I have a few follow-up questions. And I would invite the panelists to add their own themes um, as they choose. But I want to start off uh, to Dr. Swaroop uh, with the first follow-up. Um, you mentioned again during your talk, during this uh, uh, session as well, uh, and as I was, I was also struck this morning in the Explorer series talks uh, that we had, that our fellows had given to the uh, students. Uh, the theme of One Health is something that seems to be um, a unifying theme to all these, and not everybody may be familiar with this. So could you spend a couple of minutes explaining what your priorities are, what One Health is, and how you see this playing out? So I think One Health is a priority which has been identified now globally when we look at all the various challenges, be it from human uh, veterinary area, looking at the climate area, all aspects of it. And I think that is some area that uh, priority which we have identified for most of the international challenges that we are taking on. And when we look at this One Health theme, it's because today when you look at the way research is moving, you look at the way we have most of our uh, priorities that we have been able to take on, this whole area of interdisciplinary research that is coming in, being able to address various priorities as they move on. I think this is an area which we would put as topmost priority because India today is definitely partnering in many of these areas be it the whole area of AMR, be it our whole, when we're looking at AMR, we are not only looking at 
the human health, but we are looking at uh, the human and the veterinary health, but we are also looking at the climate-related EMR aspects. So I think those, the industry-related, the environment-related uh, activities, so I think these are priorities that we are taking on within the country. Today we have a large number of programs that we have taken up with the various ministries be it the Ministry of Environment or the Indian Council of Agricultural Research or the Indian Council of Medical Research, to be able to see how could we set up these sort of uh, major networks which would then be more inclusive to take on aspects which do not get limited with just one priority, but look at it inclusively because solutions from the innovations that we drive from one would be solutions for the other. And I think that really is what we are looking at. How do we have these innovations moving for solutions across a large number of areas? So this is definitely a huge priority for us. And we hope that while we are doing it for other international partnerships, the Alliance program in biomedical research would be able to contribute greatly to building capacities for this. Great. So I'm, I think, uh, you know, biology is growing so fast that there is sort of this uh, force to fragment into, into sub-disciplines. Uh, and within academia, that seems to be going strong. Molecular biologists don't talk to evolutionary biologists. And I think it's very proactive for the DBT to come forward with a more unifying effort. Um, and of course, it's going to pay off. Um, OK, so um, now I'd like to turn to Dr. Farrar. Uh, I know that during your uh, directorship, the Wellcome Trust has sort of recalibrated uh, your international, well, your funding priorities. Um, so I'd like to know a couple of things. First, you know, what is the 10-year vision for the Wellcome Trust, um, not just with respect to the India Alliance? And secondly, could you share with us any um, uh, experience you've had with unique mechanisms of science funding in the UK or other parts of the world uh, from which we might borrow ideas for what to do going uh, forward here. Yeah, thanks very much. I, I, I think um, the welcome, as indeed with the Alliance, is in a um, really incredibly pri privileged position. We're, in, we're, we're not within government, but we're linked with government. Um, we're outside the system. And if you go back to listening to the comments came up from those three or four glasses of wine or setting up in Hyderabad or whatever, one of the threads that comes through it is that you were tr trying to do something different. That you were at the edge of what was acceptable in the culture in which you were in. And I think that's a very strong responsibility of agencies that have the privilege to be in the, have the freedom that the Welcome has and I believe the Alliance has. Um, so I think if you're not at the edge, if you're not pushing the boundaries of what scientific endeavor and the way you fund it and support it are doing, then I don't think you're living up to your responsibilities. Because you might as well just give that money to a government, and the government could do it through a government mechanism. So we are in an, in an incredibly privileged position, and I believe it's our responsibility to use that freedom to really push the boundaries. So the next 10 years, the worst thing that could happen, and I said this when I started at Welcome as well, the worst thing that could happen was that you become part of the establishment, you become conservative, and you become complacent with the way you work. I do not believe that that will happen. But that is the greatest risk, because you are in a unique position and you, must, you have a responsibility to use that. Um, that will mean renewal. It will mean stopping saying, this is how welcome does it, so we're, this is how we're going to do it tomorrow. It's not because you want to change what you do today, but you won't be doing the same things tomorrow. And the Alliance must constantly push itself to stop ever asking or saying the comment, this is how the Alliance does it. Because next year must be different to this year. And 10 years from now, as I said in my talk, science and society will look very different. And I think the Alliance could push welcome. And I think welcome might a little bit push the Alliance. Because if we push each other, we're likely to end up in a more interesting place. I think science is going through a change, and I hope over the next few years, Welcome will play a role in helping to drive that. I think it is about uh, setting priorities. It's about being focused on what you're trying to deliver, being clear how you're going to do that, communicating that so you're transparent with the community, the science, and the public that you work with so that they're clear what you're trying to do. Um, and there's no secrets about what you're trying to do. You may be a tough reviewer. You may not be able to say yes to everybody, 
but at least the community, the science community and the public know what you're trying to achieve. And that's a critical role that I think we can play. So I think my comment would be, you have an unbelievable privilege and the most important responsibility that comes with that is to use that in ways that others can't. Um, so, uh, Dr. Bhan, I want to bring this back to you. You started off with a comment saying you walked into a room and you didn't see any leaders. Um, now that, um, not just because of the alliance activities, but that science in India has matured over the last 10 years across the board, um, what do you see for the capacity of young scientists in India to play leadership roles? Do they do it within institutions? Do they do it in partnership with the government? What are all the ideas that you could pass on to somebody here who wants to do something in addition to the work they're doing in their laboratories? See, in one way, I have always grown in India. I have never been educated in any institution outside. So I realized that I deliberately made a choice to pay a price because I love the Western great institutions. But I also realized that many people who had that Western education, when I talked to them in India, they didn't seem to know why an MIT is an MIT or Oxford has remained excellent for centuries. And I thought, they don't seem to write history, they don't seem to read history, they don't seem to read anything of the big picture of this universe. You know. And so I asked many of my friends and I said, do you know why Stanford produces great innovators? Or what's good about Wellcome Trust or NIH? So I think being aware of unique, gifted, excellent ways of doing things and then being gentle in design. I'm a, a, a follower of Lord Krishna. So I like to be playful. I don't quarrel with politicians. I don't quarrel with fellows. I never complain about anything in life. And I'm just looking at some little opportunity somewhere to redesign something in a very gentle way. And it will, as it look, many times, sometimes people uh, may not even be aware that I'm doing something deliberately. So I think we have a difficult last couple of centuries and so we have inherited a system of governance, we have challenges on many fronts. But what younger scientists should know is to be aware of an environment. You can't excel if your environment is not excellent. But that environment cannot be changed without nurturing care of our environment. So if you go to a committee in DBT, do it with grace and seriousness. If you provide feedback, do it. As, you have to create this culture, right? And that's the reason why we invited Welcome Trust, because we wanted to closely watch the way they do things. And it was our way of showing affection and respect for years of hard work. And so therefore, I actually think that we need more dialogue about and more awareness about uh, our challenges, our opportunities, the way to do it. Sometimes you should look from outside and look at yourself and say, how do we do things? Uh, I'm still very concerned about the quality of conversation in our universities, our institutions, and I get quite disturbed by the way leaders shape conversation in our education and science, you know. But, as I said, my way of engaging is gentle, it's affectionate. I advise you because I care and love you and I want you to do things well. I don't sit on judgment because that's a waste of time. I don't want to nag and complain all the time because I'm a problem solver. And therefore, how do we all collectively spend 5% of our time as scientists to contribute to the shaping of our environment in which we will work. Just 5% of your time on these issues. This is community service. I heard this from Ron Vail when he organized that young investigator meeting in Pune. It was beautiful. He narrated to us the story of where Bishop and Warmus and all these guys were working together and they took this oath that they will give 5% of their time to make their university world famous and he said they won five Nobel Prizes in the three buildings, you know. This kind
kind of love for your environment so that next generation of children, young people who grow, we leave a better environment for them. So just watch, observe, study the best in the world, be unabashed in your admiration of the best in the world. The best institutions, the best processes, the best cultures, invite them, be with them, watch them. And then take those lessons back to your own environment. And slowly, slowly we will craft an India in which people would love to do science, people would love to apply science to social problems, and people would learn how to collaborate and the meaning of team science, the, a, a higher purpose of human life where collaborating rather than competing might actually be a nice thing to do, may solve more problems. And I think that let us not lose momentum in that direction. We have just taken a few beginning steps. Don't get excited. The problems and challenges and opportunities in this universe today are massive. We are even contemplating the fact that there may be no planet here. Can you imagine that? You know? And I think the world needs leadership and it needs great science and technology. That's our best hope. So we have a huge responsibility on ourselves and so we should all, and it's only when our institutions thrive, you know. And people love to walk in the lawns of institutions when it's a pleasure to even go to meet a financial advisor, you know. Then we have actually, so Pandian wasn't always the Pandian he was. It took some work. And that work is the Lord Krishna path, you know. I used to sit with him and tell him about the dreams of future India. I have actually guzzled a lot of red wine with him to make <laughs> him understand that science can be a pleasure and it's not about rules. So I think you have to engage with the Indians who are difficult and make them see the world through your eyes in your own ways of doing things. This is all labor of love. You know? and that's the only way you can redesign this environment. Thank you. So, um, thank you. On, on the same theme, uh, Dr. Lohia, not to put you in the spot or for that matter to put Shahid Jamil on the spot, but who will be, who in your mind is the ideal CEO for the India Alliance going forward? You said you were a, an accidental choice, but if you, if you were able to be the puppeteer, would it be a clinical researcher, would it, would it be a basic biologist? I mean, given the spectrum of actual science that's involved, no single person could have every aspect of it in their head, or would it be a professional science administrator? Oh, no, 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 no. It has to be a scientist. Only a scientist knows the pain of not getting funded. <laughs> and the deeper your pain, the more committed you are to provide fair and generous funding. It has to be a scientist. It doesn't matter if it's a clinical scientist, it's a physician, a basic scientist, doesn't matter. Just somebody who's felt a lot of pain and is also committed to excellence. One thing I learned in the review process was a lot of how much attention there was given to detail, which I had never encountered before. I had written a NIH-associated uh, grant, I had written this. They all had different methods. But in the India Alliance, as uh, Dr. Farrar mentioned, we became somebody, a third body, a different body. They had to be sensitive to local issues. When we were funding someone who came from a university, somebody who was coming from a, going to a small town versus somebody going to, let's say, Bangalore or Delhi, the concerns had to be tweaked a bit. So where the infrastructure didn't exist, the scientist, the CEO, had to say, I know it doesn't exist there. I request the committee to provide more. And we would have more flexible funding there. So I don't think it matters which branch of science you come from. But you have to be a scientist who has to be the CEO. My, uh, when Vijay was telling me in the beginning to become the CEO, I said, but I've never done administration. He said, but then you have to do it. Of course, you can't beat Vijay. So, you know, and if Vijay could become the DBT secretary and then now the PSA, we have here a role model of going from a fantastic scientist leading a research institution of the highest order to becoming the government's policy advisor. I think you have to be a scientist at the base. So while Shahid and I have had our run at doing our level of science, someone else who will come after Shahid, I hope Shahid stays for a long, long time, but whoever comes after that also has to be in the same vein. And someone who has 
really, really wanted more funding. Thank you. So, <laughs> um, so it's, it's good to notch up those rejections. Yeah. Um, so, um, we're running out of time, so I'm going to uh, have one last question for Dr. Vijay Raghavan, and then I'm going to let all the panelists uh, close with, with their brief remarks. So Vijay, there was a story in the late 1990s, General Motors, which was having great trouble at the time, partnered with Toyota, which was the, the most profitable car company in the world, and they set up a common factory uh, in the hope that they could learn from each other. And the immediate aftermath of that was that Toyota went from the most profitable company to a basket case. Um, so in that context, it's nothing short of a miracle that this initiative has survived, has gone from strength to strength over the years. It is not accidental. It required a lot of choices. It required a lot of things to go right. So I'd like to know uh, from your perch high up, um, how can the lessons of this be now distributed to other branches of uh, administration, bureaucracy, government, um, in a way which uh, takes the lessons here, but uh, allows scaling beyond, you know, the small collection of people in this room. Well, um, first of all, let me, uh, well, I'll address this point about how does one take this model to other contexts, and then come to uh, the other aspect about um, leadership and how the alliance can actually go to the next step. Now, I think scaling is a fundamental fallacy which we make when we look at small but beautiful and say, how can we replicate that into larger context? From an engineering point of view, you need to actually develop a much larger model to then see whether you can scale that or not. And India, as an entity is too large a model, and the alliance as an entity is too small a model. From a policy perspective, it would be good to scale, before scaling, to show the effectiveness of models such as Pune, Hyderabad, or Bangalore, each of which is potentially, has got a population, has got a population and potentially the science of a small European country. Can Bangalore be Switzerland? If so, what would you need to do? And the answer, the mistake we're making over there is we're asking what can we do to science in Bangalore to make it world class? But for Bangalore or Hyderabad or Pune to be world class, you need not just the science, you need the schools, the colleges, the education system, the attractiveness of the location, transport and everything, but that is all feasible on a city scale. And that's what we need to actually get to the doing, and that's where science can put pressure on your local legislative assembly member, your parliamentarians, your city people, international collaborators to drive that. So our passion as scientists should be to take ownership of our cities, make them hubs which interact with the rest of the ecosystem, draw people and feed them back into these places. That's a scalable model. Uh, the alliance or some of our top institutions are nice to look at, they function well, we should be proud of them, but that's not scalable in a country this size. Now the second component, very quickly, relates to what Dr. Bhan said and what you said about science becoming so intensely specialized that no one person can cover the whole spectrum needed, and Dr. Bhan talked about the importance of leadership. Now, both these are important, but I would actually beg to <coughs> defer with you on the specialization requiring perhaps an isolation, but I would say that the alliance can be made an experimental tube for actually breaking the barriers much more in a manner which our science agencies and indeed the Wellcome Trust may not be able to break. There's nothing to stop the alliance administration to look at science in a much more collaborative way, as Dr. Barnes said, but break out of the silos of even biology, in, of even clinical research, and you know, give fellowships to mathematicians, give fellow, fellowships to theoretical physicists, to experimental physicists, give fellowships to teams. These are you know, adventures which you can embark on now 
and you can also, given the flexibility of the new model of the alliance, get resources internationally to do that, to solve big problems in teams. Drive away from, you know, individual driven accomplishment, which is very important, but see that as coming more as a consequence of teamwork and large scale problem solving, whether in the most fundamental of issues or the most applied ones. And that's something which if the Alliance can show as a proof of principle, it should push our science agencies in India to work a lot more together. I mean, in theory, we are increasing that, but in practice, it means that there's a common file rather than a common program. And that needs to be pushed hugely. It can put pressure on the Wellcome Trust to say that we are not the world's largest biomedical charity, but we are the world's largest science charity with an anchor in, in, in biomedical research. And these are things which the Alliance can experiment and try. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> so um, we've reached the end of our hour. So what I'd like to do is ask the panelists, starting from Vijay and coming in this direction, if you have any closing comments very briefly uh, to share with the audience. Well, just one sentence. The Alliance grew by trying something which wasn't there. The Alliance must now grow further by trying something different and not more of the same. Dr. Bhan. <laughs> yeah, establish your own culture um, and, and never accept uh, that you'll just be the same in the future uh, and own your own destiny. Think for the long term, trust youth, and don't try and mi micromanage it. Hello, here. No, he's passed. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you can, I think this was Aldous Huxley, I, I think so, uh, in a line when I was a kid. And he said, man's destiny is to push his environment. Push it to a degree that the thread doesn't break, but it stretches. Our job is to stretch the environment in which we do science and the environment in which we apply science to help societies and our environment. Don't stop pushing, but be delicate, effective, caring in the way you push. And I think doors open up. I have never found uh, finance ministries, cabinets difficult. I actually found everyone easy, and then I kept thinking, there is a way by which you begin to attract people to see that what you're saying is all for the good. So the way you engage must itself have excellence. And then the doors will open up. Thank you. At a personal level, it will give me great, great joy if the rigor of scientific review, the flexibility of funding, and the generosity of the support that the India Alliance built into its model is adopted by other funding agencies in India. This would be my dream. And finally, Dr. Swaroop. I think I'd just like to say that 10 years, so the Alliance is no longer a toddler. Uh, you need to now move into the next phase and just push your benchmarks as high as you can. You have the flexibility of a very unique structure. Don't let go of that flexibility. Make sure that you keep trying out experiments, which would then help us to look at those models as models that we can build on for other areas or for, or for future groups. So just, just enjoy that foundation that you have and build as much as you can on that. Thank you. So with that, uh, I'd like to close just to, I hope you all, uh, it, it's uh, dawned upon us now. This is of course an important occasion. I mean, 10 years is a long time. Um, the fact that we've had this success, the fact that we're celebrating this event is important. We were graced by the President of India uh, with his presence. We chose that the country is behind this effort, the country needs you, and it's time to step forward. Um, so I'd like to close by congratulating the India Alliance and uh, all the people behind the Alliance and all the present and past fellows um, and everybody else that uh, put their time and effort into making this 
a success. I want to thank the panelists and thank the audience for your attention. And I think we close the session. Thank you. <laughs>